and welcome to UAT Time within the United Countries special by First Ukraine. You can find us on the frequencies available on our website, firstuaid.com. I'm Sergei Vilichansky. And I am Olivier Vidrin. UAT Time is dedicated to bring Ukraine and Europe closer to each other by introducing the red Ukraine to the rest of the world. As of today, we join a world campaign, Let My People Go. 25 Ukrainian citizens have been illegally detained and kept on the Russian territory at this time. 25 is the number of people that we know of. Could there be more? You can never be sure when dealing with Russian-backed terrorists. You can find more info under the hashtags Free Savchenka and Let My People Go. And today we want to discuss, uh, we want to dedicate quality time to discuss Ukraine and EU relationships, the myths and the truth. Our guest today is Jocelyn Guiton, the first secretary at the delegation of the European Union in Ukraine. Thank you very much for joining us. Uh, I think the European Union and Ukraine relationships, probably they're one of the most important and vital issues that is being discussed because, you know, that was the reason for the Euromaidan to yeah. take place, mm. the signing of the association. But then there are other issues that come up and suddenly uh, people don't see a lot of things, uh, you know, that would hopefully develop, like the free visa, the free trade, all those things. Some of them are happening, some of those things, but people don't know them because there is a lack of communication. So uh, one of the first probably questions would be, are Eastern Partnership and the EU-Ukraine Association Agreement meant to force Ukraine to choose between East and West? Now, I think that's a very valid question, and that's probably uh, one of the biggest myths uh, that has developed uh, in Ukraine, but probably in Russia and in, in Western Europe too over the past few years. Um, one thing I want to stress is that on the EU side, we believe very much that trade is a win-win, is a, is a win-win process. Everyone can benefit of, uh, of more free trade. That's, what, that's why in the EU we support very much the World Trade Organization, and we are very happy to sign uh, trade agreements with plenty of countries all over the world. And what is true for the EU is also true for Ukraine. And, when, uh, and Ukraine is legally, technically, uh, economically, fully able to develop closer economic relationship with Russia, with the EU, but with plenty of other countries all over the world. So by having deeper, deeper economic ties uh, mm -hmm. with the EU, there is absolutely no reason why Ukraine could not have also strong economic ties uh, with Russia. So in no case, uh, the trade agreement uh, which uh, the EU has offered to, to Ukraine, this association agreement, was a way to say to Ukraine, if you, if you get closer economic relationship with us, you have to give up your economic relationship with Russia. Not at all. I can quote you a perfect example, for instance. A country like Serbia has a free trade agreement with Russia and has a free trade agreement with the EU. And that's not a problem at all. So there is no legal, uh, no technical reason why you cannot have economic relationship with the country. That is unbelievable. Yeah. <laughs> because I don't know why, but our government always plays this card uh, that, you know, you, you have to choose either, either. Let me make, okay. maybe make one thing clear. What is true is that you cannot be, Ukraine could not be part of the customs union, okay. uh, of the, which is now the Eurasian Economic Union, okay. because it's a customs union. Sure. And once you're part of a customs union, you, have to, you need to have a single economic policy. Okay. Just to make it clear, okay. uh, for France, for instance, could not sign a free trade agreement alone with another uh, member, with the US, for instance, mm -hmm. because France is, belongs to the EU, and then in the EU, we need to have a, a, a single trade policy. Uh, and and we, we need to speak with one voice. So if Ukraine wanted to join the customs union, which is now the Eurasian Economic Union, then it would not be possible for Ukraine anymore okay. to have a free okay. trade agreement on its own with the EU. But you can completely have two separate free trade agreements, one, one, one mm -hmm. with Russia and one with the EU. That's absolutely, uh, that's the case with, I could quote you, dozens of examples. Okay. Yeah, like Serbia. That That's much. amazing because, you know, not, not a lot of communication on that. Uh, I'm sure, there, you know, there are forums, there are economical forums and discussions that be, the people that are into this topic, they probably know. But uh, the majority of people on the just a basic level 
of uh, you know uh, the best thing they know about economical forums is just a report that they took place. That's all. Uh, the majority of people really don't understand that. The thing that you have to admit is a rather technical issue, and uh, and indeed plenty of people play. Uh, typically, uh, when I arrived in Ukraine in 2013, you had plenty of uh, anti-EU movements who were trying to explain that indeed it was either or. You could not, uh, you had to choose between East and West, between Russia and the EU, which is absolutely not true. And uh, I think there is no reason um, why Ukraine should, uh, sh should stop trading with Russia. Of course, I know it's today, they obviously, it's simply that Russia is, yes. uh, is imposing sanctions uh, on Ukraine because mm -hmm. Ukraine signed this uh, trade agreement with the EU, this association agreement. Yes. Uh, but this is a purely political issue. Yes. Uh, there is no legal no economic reason why such, such a trade agreement uh, would arm the Russian economy or, or because you, why Ukraine would have to choose. I have, I have another question because uh, yes. if, the, if the EU had uh, consulted Russia on the Eastern Partnership or the EU-Ukraine Association Agreement, could we have avoided this crisis? Um, I wouldn't... Well, uh, first, first of all, this the, the, the negotiations on this agreement were extremely transparent. They started in 2008 uh, when we, we launched the uh, EU East Eastern Partnership. It was a partnership between the EU on one side and six countries on the other side, Belarus, uh, Azerbaijan, Georgia, Moldova, Ukraine and Armenia. And then a uh, trade negotiation started. These negotiations were I wouldn't say completely transparent because you always need a certain degree of secrecy when you negotiate a trade deal. Mm -hmm. But everyone knew that there was a trade agreement being negotiated between the EU and Ukraine. Second, uh, in the meantime, uh, you had several summits between the EU and Russia. And surprisingly, uh, Russia never raised any concern before 2013. Before the Maidan Revolution, never ever Russia raised any concern. So I would say that Russia was completely informed of the topic. Then consulted, it's, it's a slightly different issue. The thing is that it's a bilat bilateral agreement. Uh, there is no, Ukraine is a sovereign country. I don't see why uh, when we negotiate a free, a free trade agreement yeah. uh, with a sovereign country, we should ask the permission. I am agree with you. I am totally agree with you. That's, that's a key point. So right now we are negotiating a tra uh, trade agreement with the US. We don't ask the permission uh, to Canada. And that's exactly the opposite actually because the EU has just uh, concluded a trade agreement with Canada, and we haven't asked the permission to the US, and the US haven't complained. So it's a fact that Russia was perfectly well informed. If Russia had concerns, Russia could totally have made this concern. I have another question, because I say, okay, if the You're EU right. uh, had consulted the Russia on the partnership or the EU uh, Ukraine Association Agreement, could we have avoided this crisis? You answered me. But I have another question. I think. I remember, maybe I am wrong, but we proposed to Russia to be a member of the, of the Eastern Partnership. We proposed to Russia, yes, to be a member a few actually, years ago. Actually, we proposed to Russia to be associated to the EU neighborhood policy, which mm -hmm. was a broader project, but less uh, uh, which, which was basically the, the genesis uh -huh. of the Eastern Partnership. And we indeed proposed to Russia to, to be associated to it. Mm -hmm. uh, Russia refused. Um, Russia, it was of course a free choice by Russia, mm -hmm. but indeed you're absolutely right. Uh, Russia was totally associated to this process, simply because I'm, come back to my, I'm coming back to my first point. Uh, the logic of the EU is that trade and, uh, re uh, and political relationships, we very much believe that it's, it's not a zero-sum game, it's a win-win process. We have all interest in uh, developing clo closer links politically, economically with all of our neighbors. Uh, it's not because we want to have a more integrated economy with Ukraine that we don't want to have the same with Russia. Actually, uh, the EU is a, close, is a l largest trade partner of Russia, so it's also Russia's interest. Um, yeah. yeah, but also, also we are well, yes, but also we have to integrate that we are postmodern society, and mm -hmm. Russia is not a postmodern society in the way of thinking. And you know that the Putin policy is not win to win; is you need a winner, you need a loser. That's very different. And that's where that's where it, it is uh, an additional question, actually, and I'm sure there will be a lot of them. Uh, <clears throat> does Russia view Ukraine as a client state? As a client state. In which sense of the term you mean? Um, the state that they that is within their closest mm. proximity, that they have exclusive rights upon, or uh, 
I think you have just mentioned two different words, and which are actually uh, yeah. two, we have two different meanings. Geography matters, of course. Yeah. Uh, and we, I, I, I would never deny the fact that uh, Ukraine and Russia have, uh, have, an, have a huge co common history. And we cannot deny that, and ge geography will always remain. Which means that, uh, of course, Russia and Ukraine uh, will probably have a special relation forever, just as France has with all of its neighbors. It makes it obvious. Uh, and I think we have to take that into account. Uh, it, it's a fact, so we have to, to, to take facts into account. But on the other hand, uh, we live in a, uh, the, 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 uh, the system into which we live in, from a geopolitical point of view today is based on sovereignty. Mm -hmm. uh, also, all member states, uh, of member states of the UN, uh, of the United Nations, are sovereign member states, which means that no member state has a special right on any other member state. No member state has a veto right uh, on any other member, uh, on any other, any other state uh, foreign policy, for instance. So these are two different things, I, I would say. Mm -hmm. uh, okay, uh, let's move on. Could the trade part of the agreement lead to economical difficulties? And I'm talking about the Ukraine side. Yeah. Well, um, the logic of free trade is that from an economic and empiric, from a theoretical, economically and empirical point of view, uh, you observe more or less always the same when a country is getting more open. Overall, uh, free trade brings, brings benefits, and that's pretty much what we've seen in all countries all over the world which have opened to free trade. Uh, when you look at uh, the most dynamic countries in uh, Southeast Asia, for instance, or the Eastern, uh, member, the Eastern member states of the EU, all those countries have benefited a lot from becoming more open. Um, on the other hand, what we also know is that free trade creates changes, transformation. Mm -hmm. Uh, so some companies, some, uh, some people may suffer. Is it a reason to be, to be protectionist and say, no, I don't want to, op to, to open because a small part, part of my population of my companies will suffer? Yeah. Is it a good reason to say, I, I want to refuse global benefits to avoid small losses? I, yeah. I, I, I strongly doubt it. I think it's the role of the government to say, okay, we have, uh, we have large benefits, we can become more modern. It's my role yeah. to redistribute, to, redistribute to, uh, to, to make this transformation as easy as possible for everyone. Um, and the, actually, we take this very much into account in the trade agreement between the EU and Ukraine, simply because this agreement is entering into force progressively. For instance, all the, all the transformations which are forced by the agreement are progressive in order to give time to Ukrainian companies to adopt new rules. Mm -hmm. uh, to, to become ready to face more competition uh, from European companies yeah. uh, and so on. But at the end of the day, uh, I think it would be a very bad mistake to, to think, okay, Ukraine is not ready now. Ukraine will never be ready. That's precisely yeah. because Ukraine has always behaved, in my view, uh, in a way that let's wait a bit more and let's wait to be ready to fight on the Ukrainian market, on the worldwide markets. Mm -hmm. But other countries are not waiting. Emerging yeah. countries with which Ukraine is competing right now are not waiting for Ukraine to become competitive. So of course, it's, it's, a, it's a transformation, Let, let's be frank. Uh, yeah. When you look at countries like Poland, Czech Republic, some companies have disappeared indeed. But does it mean that Poland today is in a worse off situation than it was 25 years ago? I, strongly, I, strong, I would strongly yeah. disagree with that. Yeah. It's a process, it's, it's complicated. No, no transformation is easy. But at the end of the day, it, I think it would be a very, a very bad mistake to refuse this transformation. In, in our interview, we, we will ask you a question uh, very, no, this is, this is a very simple question, but this is the question, they yeah. are the question that everybody want to know. Do you want to know. touch on another question? Yeah. Okay, but uh, I want to... You want to add something? Yes, okay. yes. Because here, uh, about the free trade, on one of the, uh, on the, uh, your integra in integration uh, website, um, there is a statement that there is only one way for a Ukrainian producer to enter the EU market is to he or she must adhere the requirements to the requirements and principles in effect uh, in Europe. These principles are already being violated as a result of Ukraine's current moratorium on inspections of enterprises working in the food industry. Is that true? Well, it's a, it's a very specific question, but okay. yes, indeed, in the sense that the EU will not change its internal rule to please Ukrainian company, companies. The EU is a competitive market. Uh, we have quite high standards to protect EU consumers. 
And we cannot say in the EU because uh, that we want to, uh, that we are ready to let uh, enter into the EU, uh, on the European market products which are not safe enough. And indeed, the fact that today Ukraine uh, is is not be well on specific on specific markets, particularly on the rules which are related to sanitary yes. issues, is behaving uh, in a more relaxed way and saying that you don't need to comply with this and that for a limited period of time. It does not help, that's sure. true, because it's a fact, and that uh, can say it very openly, uh, EU rules are complicated, and if you want to sell on the EU market, you have to comply with European rules, uh, full stop. We, this, will be, this will be the same, this is the case now, this will be the same for, 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 for a while at least. Um, so of course it's difficult, but Ukraine has all the assets necessary to, to be able to enter the EU market. And, and that's why uh, what you, the, the, okay. the sentence you quoted yeah. is absolutely correct. And okay. that's very good for Ukraine because oh. at the end, Ukraine will have a new product. Well, and, uh, and they, 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 transitional they, time. Yeah, that's this is, thing. and that's very important for Ukraine because, uh, as you said, Ukraine has everything to be a successful country, everything. Before you move on to another question, yeah. I want to invite everyone to our Facebook pages. Uh, if you're on Facebook, find us there, facebook.com slash first UA channel or facebook.com slash UAT time and let us know what you think and uh, let us know who you want us to invite uh, to the show uh, so our programs will be more and more uh, interesting for you. Thank you. Okay. Yes. And then, uh, you know, uh, we took some very simple questions. As I say that those questions are very simple, but everyone want to know the answers of this question. Oh. For these questions. Then, uh, my question will be, does the agreement with the EU prevent Ukraine from establishing or maintaining closer links with the custom union, Eurasian Union, between the Russian Federation, Belarus, and Kazakhstan? Thank you you already, you I, already. My party yeah. touched uh, this topic, but it, I think it's quite an important one because indeed it's one, one of which, which is very, a topic which is very yeah. often misunderstood. So just to be very clear on that, Ukraine can completely uh, have this association agreement with the EU and, for instance, sign a free trade agreement with the uh, Eurasian Economic Union. That's completely possible. Uh, what is not possible is for Ukraine to have both an association agreement with the EU and be part of the Eurasian Economic Union. Then, then that, that's very nice for Ukraine because Ukraine can, be, can, can have a free agreement treaty with the with EU and free agreement treaty with, with Russia, with Absolutely. Kazakhstan and with Belarus. That's a, that's a very good for Ukraine. Provided yeah. that Russia uh, and Ukraine wants to have close yes, economic course, relations right this, now. But from a legal, from a technical point yeah. of view, absolutely. From okay. a political point of view, that's another that's, issue. That's another question. That's but, another question. And it may take some time to... S settle all these things and feelings and emotions and all that. But then uh, maybe I, I can ask yeah. a, a new question. That, uh, uh, will Ukrainian companies be able to cope with the introduction of the EU standards and regulations or will they lose out to EU companies? Well, I, I think two, two, two answers to that uh, question because indeed there are almost two questions to that. First, first of all, once again, it's a challenge. Uh, it, and that's precisely why the agreement foresees that it, this will be progressive. Uh, when you look at the details of the agreement, what it says is basically that Ukraine will have to adopt EU rules and standards, but that it is spread over a number of years, up to 10 years, basically. It's on a case-by-case -case basis. For the easiest rules, it's uh, in a few years. For the most complicated ones, it's up to 10 years. Um, so, of course, I don't deny the fact that it will be complicated, but many or plenty of other countries have been able to go through that process. Uh, so why would, would Ukraine not be able to do it? Um, second, does it mean that Ukrainian company uh, will suffer from higher competition? From a theoretical point of view, yes, uh, because of course now uh, the Ukrainian market is becoming more open to products from the EU because you have less tariff duties. But on the other hand, what you should observe in practical terms on the Ukraine market is that it's very rare that you have uh, products from Germany, from France, from Sweden competing face-to-face -face, uh, with Ukrainian products. In most cases, these are not, not the same markets. Yeah. If you look at cars, for instance, mm -hmm. when someone can afford and want to buy a European car, this person is not hesitating between a Ukrainian car and a German car. Mm -hmm. it's, and I could give you other examples, but uh, there are very few cases where there is direct competition between Ukrainian and uh, foreign and Western products, uh, well, Western European products. 
So it's very theoretical, and I doubt uh, that, you, that the, today competition will increase so much that Ukrainian companies would suffer specifically because of this association agreement. Because in some cases, maybe, yes. We, we are in two different type of products. I think, yeah, I really yeah. think so. I'm, I'm agreeing. Okay. To bring a little fun into our discussion is when you're talking about cars. Zaporozhye. At first I thought, no, at first I thought you were talking about cows. <laughs> so it was like between the German cow and the oh, yeah. Ukrainian cow. That must be my French there, accent, I'm there, sorry for that. No, it's all right. But I was like, you know, but there are some good cows here in Ukraine, you know. Absolutely. Definitely not but, competing well, you know, with the when, cars. When you spoke about, about cars, I, I, I was thinking about Zaporozhye, you know the Zaporozhye car. I know, I know, yeah. yeah, this yeah. Is, that was a, a Ukrainian that, brand. Mm. That's the one that you need to push. <laughs> well, anyway, um, we've got a couple of more uh, minutes uh -huh. uh, in this show, but we will, con we will continue. We have a lot of more questions in the part two. So stay tuned and definitely check us out on uh, Facebook and uh, uh, YouTube. Now, the next question is, will Ukraine's traditional exports to Russia, as well as cooperation with Russia companies, be disturbed because of the adoption of Ukrainian or uh, European standards? Well, it's becoming a very theoretical question now because, because of all the sanctions or the retaliatory That's measures true. that Russia has adopted against Ukraine, trade between the EU, uh, sorry, between uh, Ukraine and Russia has decreased enormously over the past mm -hmm. two years. So this trade is becoming very negligible. Um, so on f uh, that's something we very much regret because of course it's not good for Ukraine economy. And as I've said, geography matters. So that we, it's a sad thing that uh, Ukraine and Russia uh, are disrupting uh, economic links. But in any case, it's absolutely not because of the association agreement. Well, first of all, for a very simple reason, is that the association agreement has entered into force three months ago. Yes. And trade between uh, Ukraine and Russia has started to decrease uh, more than two, uh, two and a half years ago. Without obvious reasons. Yeah, well, without, without obvious, uh, with pure yeah, political, with reason. political reasons. So yeah. that, that's the first thing. So clearly, uh, trade has decreased, but obviously not because of the agreement, which was not into force. Second, uh, the EU is a main import partner of Russia. Mm -hmm. And it meaning that European companies, when they want to sell on the Russian market, they simply have to comply with, uh, with Russian rules, and still they export a lot. The EU, European companies export a lot to Russia. So the fact that you, have, and that you have European rules, and of course European companies comply with European rules. When you have a French, a Spanish company, an Italian one, they comply with uh, the rules of the EU. And still they are very much able to, uh, to sell on the Russian market. Yeah. So there, I, I struggle to see any reason why Ukraine, by complying with European rules, could not sell on the Russian market I anymore. I think this will be more easy. Right. The rules are different. You, you, I guess you mean that European rules are often higher, uh, quality. Higher, higher quality. Yeah. Very often they are different, uh, so it's not always easy to compare. Mm. But in many cases, you're right, they are of higher quality. But in any case, uh, we, we could argue from a theoretical point of view, but at least from a practical point of view, uh, you, you see plenty of European cars in the street of Moscow. I, I will have a, a, a big sense of humor, but uh, you know, if you go to Russia, everybody uh, is talking about a euro remont and not mm. about a risky remont. Yeah. <laughs> That's an example of European quality. Well, yeah, euro remont <laughs> came uh, all the way from uh, early 80s, pretty yeah, much. Yeah. Yeah, so. Anyway, uh, we have a lot more. Um, questions to discuss in the part two so stay tuned and find us uh, on the on the internet yeah. it was united country uat time by first ukraine our guest was jocelyn Gitton, the first secretary of the delegation of the eu in ukraine olivier Drin and sergey vichansky were working for you in the studio stay with us and we will show to you the real ukraine thank you for being with us have a good day and see you soon